The Gophers received not one, but two preseason honors players for the conference of the Big Ten. And we're going to talk about Louisiana Lafayette, the last non-conference game at Locked On Golden Gophers. Hey, you are no Locked happens, On Golden Gophers. No matter what we're going to do here, we're just going to keep rowing. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota uh, Golden turns out, Gophers. Turns out, we're just going to keep rowing. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're just going to keep rowing, keep rowing, and keep rowing. You are listening to Locked On Golden Gophers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name's Kane Robb, host of the podcast, former collegiate football video coordinator and recruiting assistant, here to talk Golden Gophers with you each and every day of the week, Monday through Friday. We're kicking it off again, back in full swing, and it is officially one day away from August. Later today, I will be in the press conference, the first official press conference to kick off training camp. So we'll have more on that tomorrow. So be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any of that content and follow wherever you get the podcast at Locked on Golden Gophers. College football is going to be here before we know it. And today we're talking about some Big Ten preseason honors that were given to some Gophers players. And then we're going to dive in with the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns. We're keeping going with the behind the enemy lines. We've got Michigan later this week, Iowa, Illinois, and more. So you're definitely going to want to be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss the latest changes with the programs that we are playing this season. Now let's talk about some of these Big Ten preseason honors. So when you're talking about the preseason honors, it is an annual list that features 10 players from across the conference. Only 10 players get named to this annual honors list. And the Gophers ended up with two out of these 10 players. The only two, only two schools in the entire conference had two players on this list. It was the Gophers and it was the Michigan Wolverine. So in good company, got a little bit of respect there, and you have to absolutely love that and appreciate that. Now, there are five players listed from each division, five from the East, five from the West, and it's voted on by media members. Now, when you're looking at the West, you've got Brevin Spanford listed tight end from the Gophers, Tyler Newbin listed safety from the Gophers, and then you've got Jerzon Newton, who is a defensive lineman from Illinois, seen as possibly the best player, not only in the Big Ten Conference on defense, but potentially in the entire country. You've got Cooper DeJean from Iowa, a defensive back, and then you've got Braylon Allen, a running back from Wisconsin. Those are your five West team or five West honored players, preseason honors. So you're looking at the four teams that have the best odds for winning the West in Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Now, when you're looking at it, they, there have been the cleveland.com poll, the one where they basically rank who they think will win the Big Ten, West, East, and the entire Big Ten as a conference. Wisconsin was picked by the most media members this year to win the West only one point ahead of Iowa. So those two are kind of at the tip top for the West and then Minnesota finished third and Illinois fourth. So like I said, representatives from the top four teams in the West. Then you flip to the East. You've got Talia Tungavailoa from Maryland. You've got Blake Corum running back from Michigan. You've got JJ McCarthy quarterback from Michigan, Marvin Harrison Jr. Wide receiver from Ohio state and Olu Fashanu, an offensive lineman from Penn State. So no defensive players on the east side when it comes to the preseason honors, whereas on the west side, we've got three defensive players in Tyler Newbin, Jerzon Newton, and Cooper DeGene. Now, honestly, Minnesota shows well, but every single player on this list, every single one of them, all 10 players listed in these preseason honors could very likely hear their names on the first two days of the draft in this upcoming NFL 2024 draft. We're talking first, second, and third round capable caliber picks on all each every single one of these 10 players. Every single one of them. So that's a lot of top-end talent in the Big Ten Conference. A lot of respect shown across all of these players, but two from Minnesota, two from Michigan. You got to feel a little bit of love there. Usually we'd have one or none on this list just because people like to overlook the Gophers program, but maybe this is a change in the times or 
it's just an anomaly. We'll find out as we continue to see these lists over the next coming off seasons. But overall, I think it was very much earned by Brevin Spanford and by Tyler Newbin. Now, we had Max Chadwick from PFF on the show last week, and he gave you some unbiased insight. Now, I've been telling you for weeks, for months, almost for a full year now, that Brevin Spanford is the truth. He's going to be an NFL guy and that he is one of the best tight ends in the country. I said he is absolutely a top five tight end in this class. I would put him top three, but... A lot of people maybe took that for granted. A lot of people were like, okay, well, you're a Gophers host, so you're going to put him up there, obviously. No, no. That is truly how talented this dude is. On top of that, Max Chadwick over at PFF said he's possibly the best all-around tight end in the entire country. Now, the tight end position is unique because they have more and more opportunities as receiving options and getting involved in the past game. And when you're looking at the best receiving tight end in the league, you're probably looking at Brock Bowers, who might be a generational talent in that capacity. But when you're adding in the other duties that the tight end gets in run blocking and being able to hold their own in the blocking game, that's where Brevin brings it to the next level. Now, Max Chadwick called him the best tight end in the Big Ten, and he doesn't believe it's particularly close. But then on top of that, he called him a top three tight end in the nation. It wasn't just Max Chadwick. It wasn't just me. But you've also got Adam Brenneman, who is a former Big Ten player. He is now a media member, does interviews with players all across the country. And he has Brevin Spanford also listed as his best tight end in the Big Ten Conference. And he played in the Big Ten Conference. He is an alum of Penn State. He set his bias aside, gave a, a, a scan of the landscape, and was like, you know what? Brevin Spanford is that dude. He's got Cade Stover at number two. He's got Colston Loveland at number three. And then he comes in with his hometown guy over at Penn State coming in at number four. So he shows love where credit, credit where credit is due, shows love out there. So Brevin Spanford is definitely starting to get more and more love nationally across the country from media members all over. Then you flip over to Tyler Newbin. And Tyler Newbin, as we've talked about, is destined for big things this season. His production has ticked up every single season that he's played for the Gophers. Every single one, his production has continued to increase in the tackles department, in the interceptions department, forcing turnovers. Tyler Newbin is an aggressive player, a high-energy player, an IQ player, and I believe he is going to have a lot of very interested suitors in the NFL. Now, he finds himself going in some very early, very early first-round mocks for the 2024 draft. But on top of that, you've got Phil Steele, who consistently puts out the College Football Magazine. He's on his 29th issue, and he's got him listed as the number one free safety in the entire country. So Tyler Newbin, Brevin Spanford, both of them get some much credit where credit is due, but they get some love over on the preseason honors list. The top end talent for Minnesota is there. We've seen that. We've talked about that. And they're starting to get some love across the country. But we're hoping that they can shock the world as the younger talent steps into their own, takes over, and replaces some big departures in Mo Ibrahim, Tanner Morgan, John Michael Schmitz, and many others, Jordan Howden, Terrell Smith. I can keep going on and on. Lots of departures from this Gophers program, but there are a lot of young players waiting in the wings that have some rotational experience that might be ready and should be ready to take the leap and keep the Gophers name in the conversation when it comes to contention in the West. Now, what we're going to do next is we are going to continue on with our Behind the Enemy Lines. We're talking about all the changes with our opponents on this 2023 schedule. Every single show, we are doing a new opponent. And today is the last of our non-conference opponents in Louisiana Lafayette. And the more I dove into this one, the more the Gophers have no excuse to drop it. I'll tell you exactly why coming up next. First, I want to talk to you about our friends over at eBay Motors. eBay Motors have you co- has you covered when it comes to finding the right parts for your vehicle. Because like every championship team, you have to be make you have to make sure you have the perfect fit in every player. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. And at eBay Motors, they have over 122 million parts to choose from to get you back in the game. That's like if you look at the transfer portal, that's like 10 times the options when it comes to 122 million parts and you can be rest assured that 
the parts that you need, you can look on there and know that they will fit your vehicle guaranteed because they have a, an opportunity with the eBay guaranteed fit where you can add your car to your garage and then look for the green check mark next to the parts. And if it has that green check mark, it's guaranteed to fit or your money back. So you can rest assured knowing that you're going to have it covered or you will get that money back. I absolutely love it. And you're gonna wanna get over to eBay, ebaymotors.com to get the right prices, the right fit, and the right parts ebay guaranteed fit is only for u.s customers eligible items only exclusions may apply all right gophers fans thank you so much for listening to lockdown golden gophers and making us your first listen when it comes to gophers daily sports and a shout out to the everydayers out there i appreciate the comments that i see over on youtube and getting active and interactive and you like if it seems like the feedback for these videos for the opponent breakdowns is appreciated I'm guessing that as we get into more Big Ten opponents, we're going to see more and more of the opposing fans in there, and I'm here for it. So get in there and defend your Gophers as we go. Get in there and, you know, ask questions. If there's any insights you're looking for, drop them in the comments below. If there's any things you want covered here at Locked On Golden Gophers, this show is for you. This is for those fans who are rowing out there. So drop the comments in the or questions in the comments below, and I will be sure to get to those. But let's talk about Louisiana Lafayette and why the Gophers should have no excuses at all in having to win this game. First, we start with the head coach. He's a former player with Louisiana Lafayette. He's a record-setting quarterback with them in his time, and he's heading into year two as the head coach. Now, last year, he led the team to another bowl game opportunity. That is their fifth straight opportunity. But that said, he had 11 all Sun Belt team players last season. Now, that's a lot of players, and that carried over from the last coach in Billy Napier, who went on to Florida. So how will it go as players from the past regime move on and players from the new regime start to step into their roles? Will this team remain a team that is continuously competitive and up there in an awesome belt conference team, or will it start to fall and things start to fall apart? Now, he had, or uh, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns had the top ranked class in 2023 in the Sun Belt. So that's a promising thing. And also, prior to being a head coach, their coach, Michael Desmoro, was, like I said, a player for the team, but he also was the co offensive coordinator prior to being head coach under the Billy Napier regime. So he's been involved in the program longer than these two seasons, and he has experience with a team that experienced a ton of success. You move on to the offensive coordinator, and you're looking at a guy named Tim Legger. On top of that, he is in his second season as offensive coordinator, similar to Desmoro. Now, he's in his second season as offensive coordinator, but he's in his sixth season with the program. So he has also been in here and experiencing the regime prior. So they have some carryover experience, which probably helped lead them back to a bowl game. But they did go six and seven on the year. So it wasn't as successful as what we're used to seeing from the Raging Cajuns. Now, he mainly was a coach with the wide receivers, but now he is an co- offensive coordinator. He, You have some, some consistency between the head coach and the offensive coordinator together again, which could lead to improvement in year two. And then finally, the defensive coordinator is none other than Lamar Morgan. Now, Lamar Morgan is newer to the program, second year as the defensive coordinator. So all three of them are back into their second year with the program. Now, Lamar Morgan was a former player for the Louisiana Raging Cajuns as well, and his defense in year one ranked in the top half of the Sun Belt Conference in total defense, and the team recorded 15 interceptions, which ranked nationally 14th in the nation. But when you're talking about uh, Lamar Morgan's experience prior to the Raging Cajuns, he was a coach at Vanderbilt in 2021. Now, when we're looking at the last three years with the Raging Cajuns, we're looking at last year with this coaching crew where they went six and seven on the year, made it to a bowl game versus Houston, but lost by a single score, 23 to 16. Then you move to 2021, 2020, and 2019, all in the Billy Napier regime. 
2021, the team was 13 and 1. 2020, they were 10 and 1. In 2019, they were 11 and 3. So this team has had a ton of success in its recent history, but last year was a big drop off with the new coaching regime. Now, obviously, the team garnered a lot of respect under then or now Florida coach Billy Napier, but both the OC and the head coach were involved in those programs. So can they find a way to get back up into that that success that they've seen in 2019 through 2021, or will it continue to fall because they just don't have that special sauce with Billy Napier? Now, when you're looking at their record against Power 5 schools, even with those Napier years included, from 2019 to 2022, the Raging Cajuns have gone 1-4 in their record with uh, or versus Power 5 schools. They only won a game in 2020, the COVID year, against Iowa State. Otherwise, they've lost all of their other Power 5 opponents, including a loss to 2019 Mississippi State, 2021 Texas, and then Florida State blew them out last year in 2022, and then a single score loss in a bowl game against Houston last year in 2022. Now, this team can manage to put up a fight, but overall, I don't know if they have the all-around talent to hang with Power 5 schools anymore. They have one transfer coming in in Trey Fright, fight who is an edge from SMU, but he didn't have any impact with SMU because he had zero logged snaps, so it's hard to project how he can impact on this defense. But when we're talking about what they have coming in at their positions, quarterback, they have a lot of players back in this quarterback room from last year. But again, last year wasn't super successful. They've got Chandler Fields, who's a redshirt junior, Ben Woolridge, who's a redshirt senior, and then Zeon Chris, who is a redshirt freshman. All of them have had some time playing in 2022, and the youngest had the best completion percentage, but he only really played in little spurts in three different games. But he had the fewest opportunities across all three. Now, when you're looking at the other two who had a heavy amount of experience, Woolridge started week seven through 11. He had two games where he threw for over 300 yards, one where he had 300 yards passing and five touchdowns with no interceptions versus Arkansas State, and then another game where he had 370 passing yards with two touchdowns, but he also had three interceptions in that game against Southern Miss. Now, his touchdown-interception ratio is 15 touchdowns to five interceptions, and that's pretty pretty darn good if you ask me. But then you flip to his opponent or his competing quarterback in uh, Chandler Fields, who was a redshirt junior. He played started in weeks one through five. Then he also came back and started in weeks 12, 13, and the bowl game as well. Now, he never passed for over 300 yards. In fact, he only had one game in all of those starts where he passed for over 200 yards. He had 230 yards in one game. Otherwise, he had an interception in half of his games, but he never had games with multiple interceptions. So both quarterbacks can take care of the ball. Chandler Fields had an 11 touchdown to four interception ratio. But me personally, looking at it all, I would rock with Woolridge regardless of being older because the production was better. The upside is better in the passing game, and you have more lethality when it comes to Getting the ball out there, 300-yard passing games, shows that he has the upside to pass the ball better. Now, if you don't want to run with him, I would take a shot with the young gun because there are a lot of departures across this entire roster. So maybe it's time to start the rebuild. Now, when you move over to the running back room, the ground game was poor last year. They didn't have a single player get above 650 rushing yards last year. Their leader in the running back room had 627 yards, and the next two running backs had 373 yards and 350 yards. Now, the touchdowns department wasn't any better. The leader, who had 627 yards, also had three rushing touchdowns. The next two running backs had two touchdowns and one touchdown. So there wasn't a lot of production in that ground game. Now, that said, the leader on the t- or the leader in that rushing program, the 627 yards and three touchdowns, he's no longer with the team. So the fall will likely be a fight between those two other running backs I mentioned in Terrence Williams and Draylon Washington, or a combo of the two. But like I said, neither one of them got above that 400 mark last year. Now they also have a three-star true freshman coming in in Elijah Davis who could try and challenge as well. But regardless, the run game hasn't been much of a staple for the Raging Cajuns. So then you're thinking, okay, well, the passing game, it must be then. The wide receivers, they got it covered, right? 
No, the passing game was more prominent, but it wasn't very impressive either. Their leader, Michael Jefferson, had 810 yards and seven touchdowns, but he's gone. Their number two wide receiver and John Stevens Jr. is also gone. And then the two other players that were high up in that roster for them was Rogers Jr. and Fleming, who both transferred to other schools. So their best returners are Peter LeBlanc and Jacob Bernard. Both are high or upperclassmen, juniors or seniors in this on this team. And neither one of them really inspire much confidence in that wide receiver's room that are returning. They'll need a youth movement in this wide receivers room because they don't have a lot of explosion in their offensive weapons. So they have five wide receivers in this 2023 class coming in, and they're going to be crossing their fingers and holding their breath that some of those guys can show out and be immediate contributors from the jump. Now, their senior tight end, Neil Johnson, is back, and he was the second on the team in receiving yards with 296 receiving yards, so he'll likely be a weapon for them again, but again, that isn't a whole lot that jumps off the page in this pass catcher's room. Now, the offensive line, I didn't dive in too deep here because as I dove in across the rest of the roster, I was like, you know what? I don't know if it's going to matter. I really don't. That is how much this is shaken up for the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. When we flip to the defense, they had a top 50 defense in the nation all around under a first-year defensive coordinator, but a lot of that could have been due to a ton of returning players coming back. They were 50th in the nation in total defense, 51st in the nation in run defense, 56th in the nation in pass defense, 37th in the nation in scoring defense, and 20th in the nation in turnovers gained. Now, the defense is what drove the success in 2022. Only three teams were able to score over 24 points on the Raging Cajuns. That was Rice, that was Southern Miss, and that was Florida State in that blowout game that I mentioned. Now, the key defenders that are returning to this squad is few and far between. They lost both of their starting cornerbacks, both of their safeties, two linebackers, an interior defensive lineman, and an edge. They lost eight full-time starters. Eight of them. You know, you only get 11. Eight of their full-time starters are gone. They lost two cornerbacks to the portal and Trey Amos, who headed to Alabama. Good on him. And then Cam Pedesclo, who headed to Tulane, who had an impressive season last year. Now, both of those were two of their top returning players in 2022 that decided not to return in 2023. But they do have two starters coming back in Sonny Hazard, who is a returning defensive lineman, and Jordan Lawson, who is a returning starter edge. They've also got a lot of players that worked into the rotation last year that will be back. They will be looked upon to step into those starter roles and not drop the ball. You're looking at Cortland Flowers, who is a DB. We're looking at Marsan Narcissi, who's a defensive lineman. Casey Osai, who is a linebacker. Tyree Skipper and Tyrone Lewis Jr., who are both safeties. They all had a lot of opportunities, but they weren't to the caliber of all those starters they lost. So they're going to be looked upon to step in from their 200 or so snaps into those 700 snap rolls that are leaving the program. Now, although they lost a ton of production defensively, they still have a number of players that have worked in a good chunk of, chunk of snaps that could step up and keep the defense humming. I wouldn't underestimate the program. I, I don't tend to est underestimate any programs, but this defense is everything towards their success. So we're going to wrap this show up talking about the strengths, the weaknesses, and the make or break for the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns coming up next. All right, Gophers fans, so we're going to talk about a make or break when it comes to the Louisiana Lafayette. And look, the only thing that this team has, in my opinion, at any chance in being in the game versus the Gophers is that can the rotational guys on defense seamlessly fill the void from all the starters lost on defense? The defense held them in the games but clearly not enough against the Power 5 opponents, seeing as they've gone 1-4 and four in the last four or five years. Now, offensively, I don't think this team can hang around with Minnesota or many Power 5 schools in general, if we're being honest. You've got some experience at the quarterback that can take care of the ball, but you don't really have any pass catchers. You don't really have any prominent running backs, and I just don't know if you can keep up. 
So you're thinking the only thing that can make you help, maybe help you in those games is the defense itself. Now, I don't want to get too overly confident because we know what happened with Bowling Green. We've seen the Gophers drop stupid games against non-conference opponents before, but this one does not feel like it would be the one. If I'm being 100% honest, this offense just cannot keep up. The defense is losing eight full-time starters, and I think the make or break is if the defense takes any sort of tumble, then this likely won't be a bowl team in 2023. It likely won't. So if this team defense can't step in and fill in for all those starters lost, it's a wrap in my opinion. Now the strengths are that they have all of their main coaching back together for year two to further the progressions and the developments with their players. They also have a a lot of experience in that quarterback room, but the upside might not be super prevalent. That said, they do tend to take care of the ball, so that is a strength. And then finally, the defense was strong last year and returned some rotational guys who are stepping into larger roles, so there is opportunity to be had. But when you're looking at the the weaknesses, you lost four of their top five receivers. You have no real strength in the ground game, zero true offensive firepower, and the defensive starters that have left the program could be irreplaceable. So that's kind of what it looks like for Louisiana Lafayette. I am not terribly scared of this team at all. Um, I mean, I don't have to play him, so I really shouldn't be. But you get what I'm saying. This non-conference one is probably the one that should be chalked up as a W from the jump. The Gophers don't have any excuses on this one. Now, tomorrow we're going to get into Big Ten opponents. We've talked about Northwestern, but that's probably the least inspiring Big Ten opponent that we've talked about so far. Tomorrow, we cover Michigan, the top dogs in the conference. Do the Gophers have any chance against them? We'll dive into it tomorrow. I hope to see you there. Row the boat, Sky, you might go Gophers. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.